So you're on this uh... very delayed flight to Miami. Yeah. You? Yeah. Red Eye is about two people who meet one night very late in the airport catching a red eye. The story of Red Eye is sort of the worst plane ride you could ever take. It takes place on the airplane where everything is compressed, but that really contributes to the sense of kind of a claustrophobic, creeping terror. It's the struggle. And, it's, and uh, it's all just contained within the coach section of the plane. I think this is a story of the worst possible person you could sit next to on a plane. There's nowhere to go. I got this script and I read it over the weekend and, you know, that Monday sent it to the studios and I think they bought it a day later. Everyone read it and just said, yeah, this is a movie. I was attracted to this project, first of all, for the script. You know, a director uh, can do nothing if he doesn't have a good script. And this uh, script by Carl Ellsworth is just remarkably constructed. The characters are very complex. Just when you think you know what's going to happen, something else happens instead. So, what are the odds, huh? Yeah. You're not stalking me, are you? No. The excitement for me is generated out of this very compelling conversation between these two individuals that starts off innocent enough, but then suddenly devolves. I was fascinated by the idea of, you, you know, you never really know who you're going to sit next to on an airplane. The element that I was most attracted to in the script was the psychological mind play between these two characters, and what it is to have to sit in one spot and be terrorized and basically held hostage without letting anyone else know what's going on. Let's break this down into a little male-driven, fact-based logic. One simple phone call saves your dad's life. I was aware that it was a page turner. It just compelled you to turn the page and see what was going to happen next. And I know from having done some films like that in the past that it was the scripts that make terrific films. I wanted to do a character piece. And in a way, I was thinking, well, can you maybe create a hybrid of sort of the independent character film meets you know, you're a sort of Hollywood-esque uh, action blockbuster. You can indeed have a character-driven piece, but also have those uh, suspense, thriller, action elements in it as well. Red Eye was filmed principally uh, in Los Angeles. All of the airplane shots were on a set. Um, there was no way in hell one could ever shoot this on a real airplane. So we had an airplane that we could take apart by sections. We could pull sections off of the side and uh, I had a, a sort of a, a crane gantry constructed along the top so we could pull out seating panels and have a camera kind of swoop down aisles and go up over people and come back down. And that was um, probably, I'd say, at least half of the shooting. I think the production value and the sort of the look of the movie is, is they just wanted to keep it as real as possible. If I do it, if I make that call, do you promise you'll tell whoever's outside my dad's house to go? You have a feeling that you're in this capsule at 30,000 feet in the air. There's one shot where you just see the plane, a very tiny little plane going through these huge cloud banks. And you have this feeling they're in this tiny ship in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> it's kind of the old horror film thing of, you know, all these things always happen in the middle of nowhere. And essentially, when you're up in a plane, that's where you are. You're up completely removed from any sort of help. You tell the flight attendant and your dad dies. It's Wes Craven, and Wes Craven has that mark. Well, the production designer uh, was uh, Bruce Miller, who, um, who's worked with me on many films. I help the director create the scenes that he needs to tell the story. He was the one that found the airplane for us. Uh, there was two or three rental places in Los Angeles, but he was able to get us into the set that really functioned well and had all the aspects of buttons and lights and everything that worked. We decided to go with a 232 seating pattern, which is a 767 airplane. We took pieces from many airplanes and put them together into this format with the overhead baggage compartments, the lighting, the seats, uh, various pieces from the various planes that we could rent or buy. And then we had a very, very talented mechanical special effects guy, Ron Balanowski, um, who is, I think, a genius. We built a deck that's 105 feet long and uh, 24 feet wide. and it has uh, 50 airbags underneath it. You know, what it does is we, we air up the airbags and it lifts the deck about a foot off the ground. Then we have hydraulic rams connected to the side of the platform, which shake it and make it look like turbulence. Please return to your seats. Thank you. The plane was really cool. It was so authentic. And to see it from the outside, it looked like this monster, especially when the hydraulics you know, were working and this plane is shifting. It was quite impressive. Any time uh, when I wanted to have 
the turbulence hit the plane, we were able to rock that plane from a mild bump to a wild roller coaster ride. It was a great combination of kind of uh, production design and mechanical design. One of the biggest challenges of shooting Red Eye was to keep it interesting with the entire second act taking place on an airplane. I mean, after a while, how many different shots can you have of two people sitting next to each other? But there are several key moments where she's out of her seat. I spent a lot of time developing little extra moments with these characters. And also, there are just two or three times when we do very dramatic camera moves for, for the takeoff and for the moment when the storm comes in and, and Rachel is kind of rocked awake in order to make it uh, just compelling. All your hotel, it's very simple. Just use your managerial pull to move key from 3825 to suite 4080. I'll leave the details to you, you just sell it. You've got the wrong person. I don't, I don't have the authority to do that. Well, I happen to know that you do, and I happen to know that you're the only voice that can get this done by the time I need it done. The challenge of shooting on a plane comes from a couple different places. Just a four-hour flight, it starts to feel real claustrophobic, so you can imagine what it's like after six weeks of sort of being in this really confined space. The other big issue with shooting on the plane was we had to keep a group of about 60 to 100 extras every day who, you know, were, were part of the cast, and they were there, and they were in certain seats, and you know, they had to wear the same clothes every day, and the same, they had to sit next to the people. So it's, it's sort of the movie, but amplified of, you know, it's bad enough to have to sit next to some of these people for four hours. These people were stuck sitting next to other people for six weeks. I thought when I first walked onto the set that I was going to go out of my mind <laughs> being, you know, in one seat for, you know, months on end. But it actually became quite cozy. In the mornings it was really cold because you're, you know, on, a, on this big stage. So I had like a, an electric blanket I could crank up and, you know, it got, it got quite comfortable. The special effects in this movie are great. The biggest special effects is the explosion towards the end of the movie um, when Mr. Keefe uh, is the target and, and a missile actually comes through the hotel lobby. Cynthia, you have got to get Keefe out of that room. But you already changed him. No, Cynthia's got nothing to Look, I think something's gonna happen. You Listen, pull the fire alarm. My character is facilitating these guys who are trying to take out this guy, Keith. The explosion is them attempting to assassinate him. So they do it from a, a rocket, from a boat. And you gotta have a good, one good explosion in every film, don't you? Uh, one of the key moments in the film is when the bad guys reveal what they're going to do to this man once they have him in this particular suite, which is a penthouse suite facing the ocean. Uh, instead of attacking from the city or from within the, the hotel, they are going to hit the place where he is with a um, essentially an anti-tank weapon, which is a you know a shoulder-launched rocket. And we basically needed to have a rocket blast destroy the hotel uh, room that they're in and the corridor just outside of it, with them barely escaping with their lives. You've got to go up there now and physically tell them, tell them that Keith is a target. Cynthia, Keith is a target. To do it, uh, they emptied the stage. There was nobody on the stage except these two stunt guys and all of Ron's people. And we just sat outside for like uh, an hour and a half waiting for it to, to either happen or not happen. And suddenly, we were told to be silent and all the fire marshals took their places and there was this enormous wham, you know? The whole stage shook. And uh, as soon as it was safe to go in, we went in and the whole thing was completely devastated. But it was. It was even pre-rigged so that when it was blown up, it looked like a hotel room that had been blown up instead of a set that had blown up. And we were able to go right in and shoot on that set, uh, the aftermath sequences. One take, one take, everything went perfectly. Nobody was hurt and it looks spectacular. There's a very powerful scene in the in the restroom with the plane. The scene in the airplane bathroom is quite it's quite confined and quite intense because it's the first time Lisa and Ripner are together after he's revealed his character, where no one else can see what's happening and it's a free for all. She has a great moment where um, she's, her face is covered with tears and she just pushes her hair back and says, "Get up." No, it's like the turning point for that character, and she, she 
gets up and you know washes her face and she starts to make her first bid for uh, getting somebody to help her by writing on the mirror. Uh, a moment later, she's about to leave and uh, opens the door and he's right there. I was wondering. <laughs> Basically, we had this tiny little set, and we had a camera on a, on a crane arm, so we didn't have to be in there with her. And, and she just really, literally falls apart. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Basically, we just turned her loose. And I said, oh, I'm not going to tell you how to do this, but just, you know, let that emotion out. <laughs> Dad, a favor, and stop gambling with his life. I would imagine the scene is maybe, I don't know, a minute and a half, two minutes, and it's just absolutely powerful and it's the turning point of the movie. Have you done something to my father? No. And it'll stay that way as long as you keep playing along. What is so powerful about this is that everybody flies nowadays. Everybody has to fly. And nobody knows who they're going to be sitting beside. It's got that kind of classic Hitchcockian shark value. And suddenly there's a twist and, and it's a series of twists. Uh, it's exciting, it's thrilling, it's, uh, the performances are amazing, and uh, there's some great action sequences in it. It's got some great jumps, some real laughs, uh, and it's just a really fun kind of human experience, a very intense but fun uh, roller coaster ride.